activities of the Industrial Revolution, but one which played a key role in the British history. The story of the alkali industry is a fascinating web of technological rivalry, of scientific progress, of men and ideas, of success and failure. Into this web we can weave another story, a story of terrible working conditions, high mortality and appalling pollution. The alkali industry is clearly something special in British industrial history, and yet its products look innocent enough. These three chemical substances are not particularly exciting to look at, but without them the Industrial Revolution would simply not have proceeded as it did. They are soda crystals, or washing soda, caustic soda, or sodium hydroxide, and soda ash. This sample, in fact, is 100 years old and came from the old alkali industry. They were used by housewives for washing, by soap boilers, and by glass manufacturers. Glass was made by heating soda ash with sand and limestone in a furnace. The molten mixture could then be removed and blown to size. Glass to make windows and bottles was increasingly sought after, and this created a tremendous demand for soda ash. Up to the end of the 18th century, users of alkali, such as soap boilers and glass makers, had to depend upon natural sources. These natural alkalis were obtained by burning vegetable matter, particularly wood and dried seaweed. Ashes obtained in that way were always expensive, were more or less impure, and the supply could never keep up with demand. So in the second half of the 18th century, chemists addressed themselves to the problem of converting common salt into synthetic alchemy. The availability of salt was not a problem. Many areas of Britain, particularly Cheshire, had extensive salt deposits. Rainwater seeping into the ground dissolved this salt, creating brine, and the brine was boiled by a coal furnace under the pan until the salt crystallized. Many methods of producing alkali from salt were tried, but most could produce only caustic soda. This was fine for soap boilers, but not for the glass industry, which needed soda ash. The problem was solved by a French chemist, Nicolas Leblanc, in the 1780s. In the first stage of Leblanc's process, sulfuric acid was poured onto the salt. This resulted in the formation of salt cake or sodium sulfate, with hydrochloric acid gas given off as a waste product. Paradoxically, this waste gas was later to give a boost to the Leblanc industry. Industrially, the acid and salt were stirred in a coal-fired salt cake pot by a man using a heavy iron rake. It was hard work. Later, mechanical salt cake furnaces appeared. This furnace still survives in a Yorkshire factory. 
At 900 degrees centigrade, the acid and salt are stirred by these massive iron paddles. Here, the salt is potassium chloride, not sodium chloride, but the process is the same. The sulfuric acid is added to the salt, which is transported to the top of the furnace by a conveyor. The design of these brick furnaces, the so-called Mannheim furnaces, dates from the late 19th century. Mechanical furnaces enabled high-quality salt cake to be produced at a great saving in cost. The next stage in Leblanc's process was to heat the salt cake with coal and limestone. The flame is not due to the coal, but to burning carbon monoxide released during the reaction. These flames were known as soda candles and gave an indication that the reaction was nearly complete. The result was called black ash, a mixture of sodium carbonate, calcium sulfide and unburnt coal. In the 1850s, mechanical furnaces were introduced the so-called black ash revolvers. The furnace was made of riveted iron plates lined with fire brick. As it revolved, flames from a coal fire or gas jet were drawn through the revolver from one end. When the reaction was finished several hours later, the furnace was tapped by opening the portholes and breaking in the crust which had formed over the opening. Discharging the revolvers was a spectacular sight. To quote a contemporary observer, the only lighting was given by the stream of red-hot ash flowing into the bogies and the flickering flames of gas burning on the surface of the black ash as it cooled. Into and out of the areas of bright light and deep gloom moved the indistinct figures of the men handling the bogies. And there was a continuous background of noise. The rattle of the driving engines, the clatter of the wheels and clogs on the floor plates, punctuated by the shouts of the foreman directing the operation of the revolver itself and the movement of the bogies. When it had cooled, the black ash was broken up with sledgehammers and transferred to iron tanks filled with water. The soda in the black ash dissolved out. This soda solution could then yield soda ash or soda crystals, or, if heated with lime, caustic soda. This, then, was the end of the process. The Leblanc soda trade was extremely wasteful. For every tonne of salt that was decomposed, one tonne of alkali waste was created, and it was dumped outside the factories in these huge waste heaps. And there are thousands and thousands of tonnes of this stuff dumped all the way along the banks of the Tyne. There were three major alkali-producing centres in Britain. Around Glasgow, on Merseyside and here on Tyneside. We're standing in front of the waste heap of the Friars Goose Chemical Works. Up there was Al Husen's, founded in 1840 and reputed to be the largest works in Europe. And downstream, Felling, Heworth, Bill Key, Hebben, Jarrow and Tyne Dock. Almost for 10 miles these factories extended. And in the 1860s there were 24 Leblanc soda works here on Tyneside. This map of Gateshead shows the extent of the Friars Goose and Al Husen's sites in 1896, some 100 years after the alkali industry started on Tyneside. At this time, Al Husen's was probably the largest chemical works in the country. 
There were three advantages for Tyneside. First, there was abundance of cheap coal. Second, the limestone was obtained almost for the asking. The wooden colliers which carried coal from the Tyne to London returned carrying ballast, which was London chalk or limestone. Thirdly, there was an expanding glass trade on Tyneside, itself attracted by the cheap coal, and this provided an outlet for the alkali. But this prosperity was not to last, for the centre of the alkali trade began to move away from Tyneside. The reason for this was the disappearance of the cheap limestone. Due to the replacement of the wooden sailing ships by iron-built colliers, which could return with water ballast contained in their double bottoms. A second factor was the opening out of the American market for alkali, and for this, Newcastle was simply on the wrong side of the country. In the 1860s and 1870s, the focus of the Leblanc industry shifted from the Newcastle area to Widnes on the banks of the River Mersey. Here, raw materials were readily available, coal from Lancashire, salt from Cheshire, limestone from Derbyshire. Widnes also had access to good transport routes, the River Mersey, the Sankey and Bridgewater canals, and a good rail network. Consumers of alkali were nearer too. The Lancashire textiles industry, the St Helens glass industry, the Merseyside soap boilers. By the turn of the century, the banks of the Sankey Canal were almost completely covered with alkali works. The area was filled with the tall chimneys and jerry-built timber sheds which characterised the Leblanc factories. All the factories are gone today, and those same banks are part of a recreation area. The first alkali factory in Widnes was built by John Hutchinson in 1847. Ironically, his firm's office, now painted orange, is almost all that remains of the area's once vast alkali industry. A contemporary observer wrote, Widnes and St Helens, where are situated the principal works in the alkali industry, are at all times the most dreary of places, for the spring never comes hither. It never comes because neither at Widnes nor at St Helens is there any place in which it can manifest itself. The foul gases which belched forth night and day from the many factories rot the clothes, the teeth, and in the end the bodies of the workers have killed every tree and every blade of grass for miles around. There is no green anywhere. Not one touch on which to rest the eye, weary of blackish brown and brownish black, of soot and mud and the foul slimes thrown up by the sewers or set down by the poisoned air. For miles around, the poisonous air kills and kills. And so frequent are the claims for compensation made by neighbouring farmers for their acid-eaten crops against the factory owners, that these have found it a matter of economy to buy up the land in the sphere of influence of their sulphuretted hydrogen and other gases. In fact, it was complaints by landowners which led to the passing of an Alkali Act. Inspectors were appointed to ensure that 95% of the hydrochloric acid gas was dissolved in water. The type of plant used for removing the acid gas was known as the Gossage Tower. The tower was filled with coke packing through which water cascaded down, so dissolving the hydrochloric acid gas rising through it. The immediate effect was to transfer the pollution from the air to the nearby waterways. Eventually, the problem of waste hydrochloric acid was solved by converting it to chlorine, which was a useful source of bleach. In this way, it became increasingly complex with a greater range of products and correspondingly less waste but the pollution and conditions for the workers remain some of the worst of any industry. Trees 
cannot live here, but men must and do. One sees numerous and fine children, but never any old people. The certainty of shortened life, the possibility of a sudden and terrible death, and constant risks of painful accidents are well known to all chemical workers in these alkali factories, and are accepted by them with an indifference which might seem callous were it not so apparently heroic. I asked one man, whom I met in one of the factories, what they were manufacturing there. Skeletons, he said. And I, you see, am only half done. It was the bleach packers who had the worst job. Bleaching powder was made by passing chlorine gas over lime on the floor of a brick or stone shed. There was always some residual chlorine and the fine powder itself was irritating. Bleach packers did wear protective clothing, but it was crude. Layers of flannel were used to keep out the dust and any bare skin was covered with grease. Bleach packers were the elite of the Leblanc works. These photographs of bleach packers taken in witness at the turn of the century show them as proud and dignified men. Towards the end of the century, the larger Leblanc factories began to make use of chemical laboratories. Men like Ferdinand Herter, shown here in his witness laboratory, applied scientific principles to the understanding of the process. Binks's burette was designed to measure the strength of alkali at the works. Acid was added drop by drop to an alkali sample, and the amount of acid needed to cause the colour change gave a measure of the alkali strength. But despite improvements in the efficiency, the threat from a rival process was mounting. This was the ammonia soda process. Since the early 19th century, it had been known that sodium carbonate could be produced by passing carbon dioxide gas through a solution of ammonia in brine. After a time, a white precipitate begins to form. This is sodium bicarbonate, which simply needs to be heated to give soda. The first commercial plant was put into operation in 1865 by the Belgian Ernest Solvay. But in Britain, the first successful plant was built in 1873 at Winnington in Cheshire by Ludwig Mond, a German immigrant, and John Brunner from Widnes. Brunner and Mond chose Winnington largely because of its access. Brine came from the nearby Cheshire salt fields. Limestone came by rail from the quarries in Derbyshire. But Brunner and Mond found that getting their plant operational wasn't easy. What seemed straightforward in the laboratory was exceedingly difficult on a plant scale. In the first stage of the Solvay process, limestone was transported to kilns where it was roasted. The carbon dioxide released in the reaction was then pumped into the bottom of one of these 80 foot high Solvay towers. This is the bottle of the laboratory experiment. Brine, saturated with ammonia, trickled down the tower against an upward stream of carbon dioxide. The sodium bicarbonate formed was recovered on a Brunnemond filter, simply a drum covered with cotton mesh. In another part of the plant, the filtered solution remaining was treated with slaked lime to recover the ammonia. Meanwhile, the sodium bicarbonate could be roasted releasing carbon dioxide and leaving soda ash. This is how soda ash packing at Winnington looked in 1928.
Another major product of Brunner Mond was soda crystals. These were made by dissolving soda ash in hot water and allowing it to cool and crystallize in large iron pans. Today, the demand for soda crystals is small. They're mainly used for domestic clothes washing. So the process has not been modernized and remains, in fact, largely unchanged from that for making soda crystals at the turn of the century, when this shed was built. In fact, the building itself is of considerable interest. It's typical of buildings which housed all chemical plants in the late 19th century, timber framed with wooden cladding. From the outside, louvered roofs for ventilation are also apparent. The ammonia soda process had a competitive advantage over Leblanc soda because it could produce a better quality soda more cheaply. It used fewer raw materials and it created far less waste. By the 1880s, Leblanc soda was selling at a loss. In 1890, 48 Leblanc factories came together to form the United Alkali Company. The formation of the UAC was a rationalization exercise. The smaller, less productive plants were quickly closed. The final blow to the Leblanc process came in the 1890s with the discovery of a way of electrolyzing salt solutions to produce not only caustic soda but also chlorine. At the negative electrode, or cathode at the left, alkali is being formed and this is turning the solution pink. At the positive electrode, or anode at the right, chlorine is being formed. With cheap electricity, Electrolysis became the standard way of making caustic soda. This relatively small grey shed houses a modern electrolysis plant, supplying something like one third of Britain's entire alkali needs. This is ICI's Kastner Kellner plant at Runcorn in Cheshire, built in 1926, ironically just across the Mersey from Widnes. By the early 1920s, the Leblanc soda process had been entirely superseded by the simpler and better understood ammonia soda and electrolytic processes. The last Leblanc soda factory, Al closed in 1926, by which time both the United Alkali Company and Brunner and Mond had been absorbed into ICI. Next week, we've an extra broadcast for the Technology and Change series. We'll be looking at the invention and early history of that bane and blessing of the 20th century, the internal combustion engine. And you can see it next Saturday morning at 5 past 8, here on 2.